your tired and bring your shame. Bring your guilt and bring your pain. Don't you know that's not your name? You will always be much more to me. Every day I wrestle with the voices that keep telling me I'm not right. But that's all.
Good morning, everyone. Just a quick reminder, um, please turn off any cell phones or pagers. Believe me, it does happen. My name's Ken Hovenkamp. I'm a chaplain for Portage Public Safety. On behalf of Cheryl and the family, we welcome you and thank you for being here. To those of you online, thank you for joining in this morning. I know you regret not being able to be here, but we're, uh, we're very happy that you're able to join. At this time of the service, we have on the stage a Trinity candle. That candle stands for the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. I would like my sister Anne's daughters, Tony and Natalie, and my son and daughter, Sean and Brooke, to come up at this point and light the candle, please. Thank you. Most of you here or online knew Bert or are friends of Bert, but not everyone. Some of you are here to support a loved one who was a friend or family member and didn't know him. So for that reason, I'm going to have just a couple quick things to kind of bring you up to speed on what Bert Hovenkamp was like. One of his oldest and dearest friends, Robert Motika, Sr., who went by, or goes by Mo, said this, Bert is one of those guys that can read people in an uncanny way. He could sit down with a banker, a lawyer, a doctor, a farmer, construction worker, or a ditch digger and perfectly relate to any one of them. My sister Anne came from Maryland earlier this year to see him before it was too late. When she got here, we talked about the fact we knew the end was coming. And we wanted to plan some things for his service, as we knew it better be right. <laughs> we talked about favorite verses, favorite songs, things like that. And we had a pretty good handle on it, but we weren't 100% sure. So Ann says, I'll just find a way to ask him. I thought, well, this ought to be good. Uh, the way Bert can read through just about anybody, Ann is going to coyly try to ask him what his favorite songs and verses are. So she did exactly that. As we were talking with him, he's laying in bed, and we had a nice conversation going, and every once in a while, Ann would kind of try to coyly throw something in about you know, so Bert, what was your, what, what's your favorite scripture? Or what's your favorite verse? And Bert looked at her and he says, what are you doing, planning my funeral? <laughs> she said, yeah, as a matter of fact, we are. She said, with your involvement, you're in a really nice position because if there's something you want to change, now would be the time to do that. And he thought for a minute, and he said, you know, there is something I want to change, Anne. And Anne responded, oh, good, what is it? He said, the date. <laughs> I 
At this point in the service, Sean Zelda, or Bert Zelda's son, Brian, is going to come up and sing a song. This particular song is one that Bert absolutely loved to hear Brian sing. And so at this time, Brian, come up and sing your version of The Dance by Garth Brooks, please. Looking back on the memory of the dance we shared beneath the stars above. For a moment, all the world was awry. How could I have known that you'd ever say goodbye? And now, Glad I didn't know the way it all would end, the way it all would go. Our lives are better left to chance. I could have missed the pain that I'd have had to miss the dance. Holding you, I held everything for a moment. It wasn't I the king? If I'd only known how the king would fall, yeah, who's to say? You know, I might have changed it all, and now. I'm glad I didn't know the way it all would end, the way it all would go. Our lives are better left to chance. Could have missed the pain that I'd have had to miss the dance. It's my life. It's better left to chance Could have missed the pain I'd have had to miss The dance Nicely done, Brian as I knew it would be. Growing up in our home, at the end of a meal, there would be a scripture reading. And when you got old enough to read, you would be taking a turn in that scripture reading. And I remember one of Bert's favorites was Ecclesiastes 3. Most of you have heard it before. I'd like to read it at this time. For everything there is a season, a time for every activity under heaven, a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to harvest, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to tear down and a time to bear up, a time to cry and a time to laugh, a time to grieve and a time to dance, a time to scatter stones and a time to gather stones, a time to embrace and a time to turn away, a time to search and a time to quit searching, a time to keep and a time to throw away, a time to tear and a time to mend, a time to be quiet and a time to speak, 
a time to love and a time to hate, a time for war and a time for peace. My sister Ann McNulty is here from Maryland. She's here with her two daughters, Tony and Natalie. Anne has prepared a eulogy to read, so at this time, her daughters will escort her up and she will do her eulogy. I am here to tell you about a remarkable man. He was my brother, Bert Hovenkamp. Bert and I were born into a world that had seen much chaos. And the events of those years, 1939 <clears throat> to 1945, would delineate our family history. I was born in 1945, and he was born two years later in 1947. It was in 1939, a few years before this time, that Europe was torn apart when a madman named Adolf Hitler scorched Europe and devastated the Netherlands where we were born. Our father, Chris Hovenkamp, who was forced to work for the Germans, had been taken prisoner by the Nazis and they deposited him into a work camp where they made him work in the fields. Our mother was able to see him periodically when she rode her bike to visit him. My father often told the story of how the German soldiers would shoot anyone who looked at them the wrong way. Yet, he was part of the Dutch underground that surreptitiously resisted the Nazis by tearing up railroad tracks and by hiding Jews who were slaughtered by the millions, actually six million. And then thankfully, the sleeping giant known as America during that time finally lumbered up to enter into the Second World War and with the help of the Allies liberated Europe on May 8th, 1945. My father was released from the work camp and I was born a month later. Now the Germans became prisoners of the Netherlands and my father oversaw their work on the polders, the land reclaimed from the North Sea. Bert was born two years later on August 28, 1947. It was during this time that my father, whose goal was to have a farm in the Netherlands, was told by the government that he would have to wait 10 years. In the Netherlands, the government owned all the land, and those that wanted to have a farm would have to wait until one was available. This did not work well for my father, and he asked his brother Bill, who had immigrated to the United States, to sponsor our family so we, would, we could come here also. Like so many others, he wanted the freedom and opportunity that this country offered. He wanted the American dream. So it was in 1949 that we immigrated to Michigan. My uncle picked us up in his Ford car and my little brother was mesmerized Auto, he kept saying, auto. We had never ridden in a car before. We moved to Kalamazoo in, to the house rented by Uncle Bill, and my two-year-old brother ran to the junker cars littering the driveway. All mm -hmm. we could see was his chubby legs as he crawled into the dusty and smelly vehicles. Th that was the beginning of the time that was yet to come when his fascination with automobiles would lead him to his life's career. Meanwhile, my parents struggled to make a living in Kalamazoo. My mother cleaned houses 
and my father, who was taking English classes, found a job at the National Water Lift Factory, a tool and dye factory. During these early years, I had a love-hate relationship with my pesky brother, who was constantly annoying me and creating mischief. For example, one day, my mother each let us each drink a bottle of pop, which was a real treat for us. Bert downed his first after adding some water to it. He thought for a moment and then insisted that I do the same. It tastes really good, Anna. Try it. I choked on that watered down pop as he laughed. Ha, ha, ha. <laughs> Decades later, he convinced me to take a ride on his ATV vehicle. What did I know? When I climbed on it, he headed straight for the pond on his property and drove right into the water with his poor sister screaming beside him. <laughs> All I heard was ha, ha, ha as he chortled with laughter while I stood in waist deep water watching the vehicle sink like a rock. It was supposed to float, he assured me. When our daughter Tony was a toddler, we all went to a restaurant for dinner. Unfortunately, Bert was sitting next to Tony and he said to her in a loud whisper, whisper hey, Tony, say bullshit. I glared at him as she shouted, bullshit, bullshit, <laughs> while other di diners shook their heads at such a misbehaving child. Ha, 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 he chuckled. But my brother met his match when I replied, Bert, can't you do something about your naughty child? <laughs> it was in 1955 that my parents, who had scrimped and saved to buy the farm my father dreamed of owning, finally made their dream come true when they were able to buy a chicken farm in Decatur. Our brother Kenny was born in 1959 and our family was complete. When Kenny was a baby, my, my father with his gruff and Dutch accented voice would bend over and say, hello fella, <laughs> whereupon the poor child would burst into tears. Our family doted on this little boy. And it was one of the lowest moments in our lives when six-year-old Kenny had to be told that our mother was killed in a car accident. As the years passed, I went on to college and began a teaching career while Bert began working in the salvage yard owned by Bob Stevens. Then later, with the same shrewdness he used to tease his sister, he was able to buy and turn a fledgling auto salvage yard into one of the largest auto parts business in Michigan, Eagle Auto Parts. Determined to be successful, he more than realized his goal. He pushed into other endeavors, always analyzing and coming up with new ideas, while my brother Ken and his wife Lori began a successful printing business. During Bert's growing years, we didn't realize how gifted he was because he didn't have much use for school. At Kalamazoo Christian High School that we both attended, the principal came up to me one day and said, Ann, what are we gonna do about Bert? <laughs> that was a question I couldn't answer. The Army had an answer for us, however, when he was drafted. Much to my amazement, oh. He, test, he tested so high on the Army's aptitude test that he was recommended for officer's candidate school at Fort Meade, Maryland. But fate intervened. After our mother's tragic car accident, my father was determined not to lose his son to a war in Vietnam. He managed to obtain a hardship discharge for him because he needed help on the farm. Meanwhile, in one of life's ironies, I went to Fort Meade instead to teach in a high school located on the base. My brother went on to become very successful. He had his hand in so many different projects. It was not only his business acumen, acumen that made him so, it was his ability to connect with so many kinds of people. This was his special gift. I was always impressed 
how he could make total strangers his friends, and he had so many of them. He was also loved and respected by his two sons, Brian and Kevin, by his wife, Cheryl, and by his stepson, Andy Truitt. Cheryl spent so much of her time caring for Bert, and her love for him was so evident during these difficult days. He was especially proud of his grandchildren, and he would tell me how much they meant to him. I sat with my brother during his last weeks, and I knew I would not see him again in this life. As I sat with him, he looked at me and he said, it won't be long now, Anna. Are you ready, I asked him. Yes. Do you have your faith? Of course. His presence on this earth helps so many others, and without a doubt, he will continue to be a presence in heaven. Bert and Cheryl attended at Calvary Reformed Church in Texas Corners for 18 years. So at this time, their pastor, Pastor Greg, is going to come up, and he's going to share a little bit about uh, the time that they spent at his church. How's that for a chaplain asking a pastor to share a little bit? Ken told me I had five minutes. I said, I will do it under five minutes. Um, Cheryl, you and Bert showed up about 17 years ago at Calvary, right when Sue and I were starting to date. And you two were in the process of your relationship. And when you came, there were some things about, about Bert, about your dad, grandfather, just some words I want to share about being a man. Number one, he was a man of his word. What he said he meant, what he meant he said. When he would shake somebody's hand, and we talked about business, when he'd shake somebody's hand and say, this is the way it should be, or this is what I want, that's what he expected. That old school idea. And I love that thought and the way that he lived his life. A man of his word. He was also a man of business. And already it's been talked about, and Ken, you might be talking more about some of his business, but he was a man of business that did extremely well in the business world, but that allowed him, it allowed Bert and Cheryl to be two people who gave. About six years ago, seven years ago, was it, Cheryl? Our church van was torched. Yeah, it was an interesting experience to look on the cameras and see the church van just on fire out in the parking lot. Well, about two months later, insurance only did a little bit, but a, two months later, we end up with another 15 passenger van from you and your husband, and we're like, how much do we owe? You guys are like, nothing, nothing. Because he was a man of business, he was able to be a man, and share yourself as a wife, of givers. He gave. Sue and I, you guys helped us with a few vehicles through the car lot. A man of giving. He came a few times with a front end loader and took care of all the snow at church. Just on a Sunday afternoon, he would say, yeah, yeah, you came because Dad said you were doing it. <laughs> Sunday is like, we got too much snow here. What are we going to do, Pastor? I go, I don't know. I can't shovel it all. He goes, Ma, I'll bring a front end loader. We'll take care of it. Stepped up quickly. He was a man of faith. A man of faith. Ten years ago you were baptized, I believe it was, in Crooked Lake. We had a baptism for some, some people at Calvary. We went to Crooked Lake. And um, Bert, we had talked, and Bert's like, I was baptized as a child. I don't need to be baptized. Cheryl's like, I want to be immersed. I want to be baptized. We did that. And, and on the shore, as Bert is standing there, I can still remember seeing there, he is just beaming like a peacock. He is so excited. A man of faith. A man of faith who brought friends to church. He brought a handful of different friends. And the one that really stands out is 
Randy Sweet. He brought Randy, and Randy hadn't given his life to Christ yet, and Bert and I talked about that. And then shortly after that, he did. He became a Christian. And Bert, I, I, I'll tell you, he was almost like giddy at the fact that his good friend had become a Christian. He was a man of family. I cannot tell you how often throughout the years, and Kevin, you and I have talked about this, about the rest of the family too, how often your dad, your grandfather talked to me and his biggest concern was his family. And not to do well business-wise, but to do well walking with the Lord. There's a great phrase, what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world yet loses his family? Bert's concern was for family to know who Jesus Christ was and is. He was a man of faith in the fact that, that he would say to me, I'd walk in sometimes and he would say, Pastor Greg, remember the light. Well, John 8 says, Jesus says, I am the light of the world. If you walk in me, you'll never be in darkness. He was a man of faith who knew that, desired everybody else to know that. Last one. He was not a man, but he was a child of God. Child of God. Came to God understanding that he was helpless, and he offered all that he had. And his desire was family to know that and also to walk with him. So those are just a few things from Calvary that, um, that who Bert was, what he meant to me and to our family. I'm going to have a prayer. Lord, we do come to you, Lord, and we give you thanks. Give you thanks for Bert's life, oh Lord. Lord, you have blessed him with all these years. And we thank you for a lamb of your own redeeming, a sheep of your own flock. That, Lord, he's with you. And, Lord, he... Nine months ago, nine months ago when we were talking in the hospital, I said, Bert, what do you want? And he goes, I want to go home. I said, home? He said, I want to go to heaven, but I want to go back to Cheryl. A man torn between two worlds because he was ready to be with you, but he loved his family so much. Lord, we give you thanks that he's now with you, and we ask for a blessing upon him. But for Cheryl, for the family, for the grandkids, Lord, give your grace and mercy as they walk into a new normal but open up their eyes to see that you are the light of the world, the light for their lives. We ask all this in your name, O Lord. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Greg. The next thing we have up is a song, and this will be done by the Bridge Worship Team. Uh, when we started to plan this service, we had picked this particular song, and uh, when I talked to Pastor Jeff about recordings, he says, no, we're not doing recordings. He says, we will have live music. So thank you, Pastor Jeff, and thank you in advance to the Bridge Worship Team. They are going to perform How Great Thou Art and ask everyone to join in, please. How great thou art, how 
great thou art, then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art, and when I think that God is Son, not sparing, sent Him to die, I scarce can take it in, that on the cross, my burden gladly bearing, he bled and died to take away my sin. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to Thee. How great Thou art, how great Thou art. When Christ shall come with shout of acclamation and take me home, what joy shall fill my heart then i shall bow in humble adoration and then proclaim my god how great thou art and then sings my soul my savior god to thee how great thou art how great thou art then sings my soul my savior god to thee how great thou art how great thou art then sings my soul my Savior God to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art, then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art. seated. Thank you. Cheryl had wrote something and she asked me to share this. Bert was a loving husband, father, and papa to all his grandchildren. He was an accomplished businessman and a friend to many. Bert rarely had an idle mind. Business was his passion, and it was a true passion that he was exceptional at. He was a mover and a shaker in the business world, and he had a hand in many successful business adventures. Hachi was his close companion, a blessing through the years. The dog became Bert's shadow going everywhere he did. From then on, everyone was taking a back seat to Hachi. Literally, Hachi always had shotgun when traveling with his master. Golf was another great passion of his. It was his happy place. His passion became a reality when he purchased a golf course with retirement on his mind. However, his health had other plans. While he was recovering, 
with the help of some caring friends, renovation on that golf course stayed on track. Unfortunately, he was unable to enjoy his game on the course he revived, and eventually he had to sell his dream. But Bert, I'm sure you're sharing your blueprints with God on the new heavenly golf course coming soon. Bert was also a man of faith, and his faith in the Lord never failed him, even as his health began to decline. The last year of his life, Bert's faith was tested greatly. Although his body was failing, his mind was sharp for much of this time, and it was very hard for a man who was always on the move to be confined to a bed. To not be mobile again would prove to be one of the hardest parts of his illness. Psalm 81.6 tells us, Now I will take the load from your shoulders. I will free your hands from their heavy tasks. It was very difficult for Bert to relinquish control, to not be able to step in and try to fix, help, or take care of situations. It weighed heavily on his heart and on his mind. He was a compassionate man who helped complete strangers, knowing that sometimes people need a helping hand. He was proud and stubborn, but also had a heart for those in need of help. It was very hard for us to watch the decline of his health, his body, and his spirit, Psalm 103, 14, 15, and 16 read as this, For he knows how weak we are. He remembers we are only dust. Our days on earth are like grass, like wildflowers. We bloom and we die. The wind blows and we are gone as though we had never been here. So this should be a lesson to learn in all of our hearts. Love, respect, and spend time with those we love. Because in the end of our time, we all know that the important things in life really aren't things at all. Bert, you were my love, my heart, partner and friend. God brought you to me, and my heart is heavy and sad to watch you leave. But I take comfort in knowing you are not suffering and there is no more pain. God has you now. Bert left an imprint on the world and in the hearts of all who knew him. He felt truly blessed by the support and love of his many friends. I'm also forever grateful for your friendship and support through the years. Whether you are family, friends, or business acquaintance, we all now must take comfort that he is in the hands of our Lord the Father, and his reward will be to dwell in the house of the Lord. I believe our Bert will hear the words, well done, good and faithful servant. Though my heart is heavy, I take comfort in knowing that someday we will be together forever in the promise of our Heavenly Father. Cheryl, that was beautiful. Thank you for letting me read it. Next, we have a scripture reading. Romans 8, 28. And it reads like this, And we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose for them. Bert had a purpose. We'll talk about that a little bit later. But at this time, we have Bert's son, Kevin, and Bert's granddaughter, Elise, 
will be coming up, and they would like to share something. Kevin, Elise? As my father would always say to the grandkids, holy chicken. Thank you all for joining us today in remembrance of my father. I know my dad is looking down right now on this and us and truly knows just how much he was loved and will be missed. What can I say about the world's greatest dad? He was honorable. He was kind. He was more than fair. He was charismatic. He was gentle. And he was giving. He worked hard at everything he put his hands on and created magic on everything he touched. He touched so many people in many different ways and was an incredible man. He loved life, he loved his family, and I know we have all heard this before and I hadn't really realized until now that life is a lot shorter than any of us realize and you just don't know what you have until it's gone. He was greatness and I already miss him so much. I love and cherish the times I spent with him, whether we were golfing, at work, or just spending Sundays together at the house. My father was simply the greatest man I've ever known. He was an incredible father to me and Brian, an incredible grandfather to our children, an incredible teacher, and an even better friend to me who was there for me through everything and every time I messed up. I can't thank him enough for everything he's done for me. He taught me so, so many lessons in life. I got my work ethic and now never stop moving because of him. It is sad that he is gone, but I know he is no longer in pain now and I know he is in better place. I miss you, Dad. I love you, Dad. You are forever will be my hero. God loves you, and now you're home. Till we meet again. Luke 137 says, For with God nothing shall be impossible. If we as family and friends can put trust in God, we can and will get through anything. While on this ride we call life, you have to take the good with the bad. Smile when you're sad. Love what you've got and remember what you had. Always forgive. Learn from your mistakes, but never regret. People change. Things go wrong. Just remember the ride goes on. I love you all. I love you, Dad. You will be missed, but never forgotten. Our speech has surprisingly a lot of similarities, so, <laughs> okay. So I want to start off by thanking everyone here for coming together to celebrate the life of my papa. And a special thank you to my sister Mackenzie for helping me write this speech. This is probably one of the hardest things I've ever had to write. I am having a hard time putting a lifetime worth of memories into words. So let's start at the beginning. As children, our papa made sure to instill certain values that we would carry with us throughout our lifetime. He taught us to never judge and to always be kind because you never know what someone else is going through. He taught us that your word is all that you have and the power of a handshake. As children, learning that last one was tough to grasp. I remember shaking on everything from chores to who's riding shotgun and the fights that ensued when someone didn't stick to their word. As we got bigger, so did our problems and so did his wisdom. No matter what we were facing, we knew who to go to. My papa taught us that the only time success comes before work is in the dictionary, so he often hired us grandkids to work for him. <laughs> I remember being 12 years old pulling weeds out of sand traps and washing golf carts for way too much money and way too many snack breaks. Although Mason and Landon might have a, had a slightly different experience, he did always have a soft spot for us girls. He taught us that almost everything is for sale, never to act on pure impulse, but most importantly, he taught us what unconditional love is.
A lot of my family members would poke fun at the fact that I could do no wrong in my papa's eyes. I could rob a bank and my papa would say, look at how smart she is to pull something like that off. That's the thing I'm going to miss most about my papa, him always being in my corner. He wasn't just in my corner, he always stood up for what was right. He was the type of man to give with nothing to gain. I still remember him telling us grandkids about the time when he went to school and discovered that another kid had no shoes to wear, and he gave that kid one of the only two pairs that he owned. As a matter of fact, he was so giving that he consistently let the boys borrow his cars despite them coming back altered each time. <laughs> this also ties in with his willingness to forgive. Speaking of his willingness to forgive, there was a time when I was around maybe 17 years old and I had all of my friends over for a party in the cabin in my papa's backyard. This is when I lived with him for a few years. And I ended up borrowing my papa's truck at 3 a.m. I got back home around 6 or 7. I thought I was so slick, slowly creeping the truck back into the exact same spot it was in before. I almost got away with it too, but I underestimated Grandma Cheryl's ability to smell mischief. My grandma confronted me and brought me to speak with my papa. I was crying so bad I was an absolute mess. I have never gotten in trouble by my papa before. As I went up to him, he asked me, why are you crying, honey? And I responded, because I messed up and I feel like I disappointed you. He said, well, are you gonna do it again? Never, papa. Well, then that's all that matters, honey. He gave me no grounding, no punishment for my actions, because he knew that the possibility of disappointing him was punishment enough for me and that I would be harder on myself than he ever could be. My papa was a man of faith and a gleaming example of love thy neighbor. He had a heart of gold and was always worried about helping others even if other people tried to convince him that they weren't deserving of his kindness. He was a man of intention. He thought about everything before acting on it, never allowing pure emotion to guide his decisions. Despite all of his success, he remained a humble man. He was the kind of person who never let you down, someone you could always count on, someone who I'll miss counting on. Along with being calm and warm-natured, he had a wit and a certain spunk about him. No matter where we went, people seemed to be drawn towards him and his charisma. I'll always remember his ability to charm his way out of every single speeding ticket, followed by a lecture on the importance of not having a lead foot like him. Knowing that my papa was sick for a while allowed me to try and prepare myself for his passing. I thought about all the good memories and fun times we had together that I would never have again. Like our long walks we would take together with Hachi, or his conflicting stories of his time in the army where according to him he was a barber, a cook, and a surgeon. I thought about never experiencing the warm comfort of his hugs, his nose and ear grabs, his contagious laughter, the sound of his voice, and the smell of his minty gum. But what no one prepares you for is that you will also crave the memories that once seemed unpleasant. Like all the times that he would wake me up at 8 a.m. during summer vacation saying, time to go to work, Al. And I would say, no, Papa, let me sleep to which he would respond, only whores make money in bed, L. <laughs> I hated it at the time, but now I would give anything for him to wake me up again. Losing the glue that held our family together has been difficult to come to terms with. However, what we have once enjoyed deeply, we can never lose. We'll carry all the amazing memories and lessons you taught us with us forever, and I can't think of a better guardian angel to watch over our family. Thank you for everything you've done for me and the rest of the family. I am the luckiest girl in the world to have been able to call you my papa for the last 23 years. I promise to make you proud every day that I walk this earth and to protect the legacy that you worked so hard to build for us. So, Papa, you're home now pain-free, and like you've said, we'll all be together in the end.
Kevin and Elise, thank you very much. <clears throat> Pastor Jeff, I'm terribly sorry. We didn't critique language when we talked about We have a song next, and this is a song that Cheryl had picked out. It's called Because You Love Me by Celine Dion. For all those times you stood by me, for all the truth that you made me see, for all the joy you brought to my life, for all the wrong that you made right. For every dream you make come true For all the love I found in you I'll be forever thankful, baby You're the one who held me up Never let me fall You're the one who saw me through Through it all You were my
We have another song that the bridge worship team is going to perform in a moment. The song is called It Is Well With My Soul. Many of you know the story behind this song, and some of you don't. So for those of you that don't, I'm going to give you just a quick overview. The song was wrote by a man named Horatio Spafford. Horatio was a very wealthy lawyer and businessman in Chicago. And um, he had four daughters, a wife, and a young son. And Horatio's family's world was just rocked when their son, at the age of four years old, died from scarlet fever. Approximately a year after that, the great fire of Chicago came through and burned out a good chunk of the family's buildings and fortune that they had Shortly after that, Horatio decided his family really needed just to get out of Chicago and take a trip to Europe. At the very last minute, he had some pressing business that came up. So Horatio couldn't go on that ship. So he sent his four daughters and his wife ahead, promising to join them as quickly as he could. Little did he know that halfway across the ocean, that ship would collide with another. The ship sank. His four daughters died at the scene. His wife was found clinging onto a piece of driftwood. She sent him a telegraph, and it simply stated, saved and alone. Horatio took the next ship that he could to get to his wife. The captain of the ship he was on knew the story of his family. And when they got to that same spot in the ocean where the ship went down that took the lives of his daughters, the captain summoned Horatio to the bridge and said, according to the charts, this is the spot I thought you'd want to know. Horatio went back to his quarters and he wrote this song. And this is a song that we're going to sing now. It is called, It Is Well With My Soul. Would you stand and sing this with us if you know the song? When peace like a river attendeth my way when sorrows like sea billows roll whatever my lot thou hast taught me to say it is well it is well with my soul it is well it is well with my soul with my soul it is well it is well with my soul though satan should buffet and trial should come that this blessed assurance control that Christ hath regarded my helpless estate and has shed his own blood for my soul. It is well. With my soul, soul. it is well, it is well with my soul. My sin, oh, the bliss of this glorious thought. My sin, not in part, but the whole is nailed to the cross and i bear it no more 
praise the Lord, praise the Lord, oh my soul, it is well, it is well. with my soul, with my soul. It, it is well, well. it is well with my soul, and Lord, haste the day when the faith shall be sight, the clouds be rolled back as a scroll, the trump shall resound, and the Lord shall descend, even so it is well with my soul. It is well with my soul. It is well, it is well with my soul. My soul, it is well, it is well with my soul. Amen. You can be seated. another scripture reading, Jeremiah 29, verses 11 through 13, read as this. For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. They are plans for good and not for disaster, to give you a future and a hope. In those days when you pray, I will listen. If you look for me wholeheartedly, you will find me. I prepared some thoughts that I'd like to share as well and a message that kind of ties those thoughts together. Life insurance. I want to talk about that for a minute. Life insurance is a legally binding contract that leaves a death benefit to the policy owner when the insured person dies. There are different types of policies, as in term life, or whole life, or universal life. I'm not going to get into any of those, because the type of life insurance I want to talk about today is eternal life insurance. This insurance started when God recognized that his people could not keep his commandments and needed a sacrifice to save them. That sacrifice was his son, Jesus. Jesus came and died on the cross to admonish the sins of those who believed in him. Now the key word here is believe. So in earthly life insurance, we call it a premium payment because we are giving money to have that benefit. For eternal life insurance, all we have to do is believe. Romans 10, verses 9 and 10, say it very clearly. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is by believing in your heart that you are made right with God and by confessing with your mouth that you're saved. This is an eternal life insurance policy for heaven. Your belief is your premium paid in full. Faith, believe, 
Those are kind of the big words that we really want to concentrate on here. How does it all start? Well, there's many different ways and many different scenarios. But I'm going to use some examples from Bert. Was he always the true example of a faith-filled man? No. At times, far from it. He was brought up in the church, but he veered away over the years. But even as he drifted from the church and didn't attend, his faith was still intact. He was just quiet about his faith, and he didn't really share it with others until later in life. I'd like to take you down memory lane for just a few minutes. So I have three examples of what I call the early Bert. I worked with him for well, close to 10 years at one of the salvage yards. So I have three stories that are early Bert salvage yard stories. And the first one I call the lucky story. Now if you knew Bert, you knew that sometimes you just shake your head in amazement because the guy would do something that was just, you'd think, dumb luck. An example of one of those things is it was a busy day at the salvage yard early in the afternoon, and Bert and I were working the counter, and he says, he says I got to get to the office. I got to make a phone call. And I looked at him, I says, you know, wow, we're busy, what's so pressing? He says, well, i got to call my stockbroker. I looked at him, he said, stockbroker? He says, yeah, he says, I decided I want to invest in stocks. He says, I've been thinking about it and researching it, and I found this one particular stock that I really want. So he goes off to the office to buy some stock from his broker, and I continue on the counter, and I had to run into the office to grab a check for something, and I overheard him say to his broker, I wish to purchase a thousand shares of, I'm going to call it ABC stock. So I walked out, not thinking anything of it. We continued business for the day. At the end of the day, we had realized that it had been very busy and a very profitable day. Sometimes at the end of a profitable day in the salvage yard business, we would go to a local bar and have a beer. We'd sometimes do that on a really slow day as well. <laughs> and then I guess if the truth be known, if it was a mediocre day, <laughs> we got to this certain bar that we always went to and um, the table was filled with some of his friends that had joined us and we're sitting there talking and everybody's telling about what they did the day, that particular day or whatever. And Bert said, uh, he says, I made an investment today. And everybody said, well, what'd you, what'd you do, Bert? And he says, well, he says, I bought 100 shares of ABC stock. And they looked, I said, oh, that's, that's kind of cool. And I looked over, I said, you didn't buy 100 shares of ABC stock. He said, well, yes, I did. He said, no, Bert, you bought 1,000 shares of ABC stock. That was the first time I ever seen his face completely pale. <laughs> he honestly thought he'd bought 100 shares and he really ordered 1,000. The next morning, Bert was at the yard unnaturally early. When 9 o'clock hit the bell, he already had the receiver in his hand and he was dialing that broker to sell 900 shares of stock. He came walking out of the office with that stupid looking half grin and I said, what? He says, well, he says, I sold that 900 shares of stock, he said, but it went up two bucks since the time I bought it yesterday. That was a lucky Bert. Made a mistake, but still made $2 a share for a nice profit of $1,800. 
There is a business side of Bert. Same salvage yard, different time. Customer comes in that I happened to wait on and he ordered a used transmission. In the salvage yard business, when you sell a part, you normally sell it with an exchange program. We call the exchange a core. The gentleman asked how much the transmission was. I said, it's $100. He says, I'll take one. I got the information. I wrote the receipt. I collected his cash. I directed the man to the overhead door at the side of the building where he would be loaded. As soon as he walked out the front door to get in his car and drive around, Bert came up and he says, hey, what did that guy order? He said, order to use transmission. He says, how'd he pay? I said, in cash. I said, huh. He says, that guy wrote me a bad check a, a, four years ago for $104. I said, how on earth would you remember this? But he did. It was four years ago. He says, I want that money back. I said, well, Bert, it's four years ago. He said, well, this is what we're going to do. We're not going to give him a transmission that's been tested. But I don't really want to just give him a core that I know is no good. If you can find one that's unknown, that hasn't been driven or tested or whatever, he said, you know, that's the one the guy ought to have. A lot of people would have just taken the $100 and said, hey, buddy, this covers your bad check from four years ago. Bert still wanted to give the guy a chance. Even though it was an unknown origin, he still wanted to give him a shot. The third story, and these all revolve around the salvage yard, this is the alternator price change story. A customer comes in, he's driving a very old car, the car's beat up. There's a lady in the front next to him, assumedly his wife, and three, maybe four children in the back seat. It's just about closing time. The guy gets out of his car, comes walking inside. He's wearing a work uniform that's worn, a little dirty. You could just tell the guy was a worker. He comes up to the counter and Bert quickly steps in place. And he asks for a used alternator. And the alternator he was asking for was a rather popular one. We sold them all day long for $20 exchange. It didn't matter if you bought one or you bought 50, it was $20 exchange. The guy asked for this particular alternator, so Bert went to the shelf and he grabbed one and he set it on the counter and he wrote out an invoice for $5 plus tax. And he handed the man the invoice and he said, there'll be $5.20, sir. And the guy looked at him kind of funny. And I'm assuming the guy called earlier and Bert gave him an, a funny look back. The guy puts his $5.20 on the counter and he went to leave. He got to the door and he turned around and he says, wait a minute, what about the... The, the core, the, the, the core charge. He says, are you going to charge me a core charge for the old alternator? And Bert says, no. He says, next time you come through, drop it off. Don't make a special trip. Or just drop it off when you come through. The guy walked out very happy. I looked at Bert and said, oh, you big softy. And he says, what are you supposed to do? He said, it's a hard-working guy. He doesn't have any money. Look at what he's driving. Car full of kids. He needs a break. So even in the early days, maybe it wasn't faith he was preaching, but he was still preaching something. 
Those are just a few of the many stories. I could sit here for a long time, but I'm going to cut it at that for the early bird. But we're going to skip years ahead. And these are two later examples of Bert. After Bert really started to share his faith. Ironically enough, I had not talked to Pastor Greg about content, but we do match up a little bit on what I'm going to share. There's a little barber shop in Schoolcraft. Maybe some of you know it. As you're coming into Schoolcraft on 131, right hand side, little red barber shop called Mike's Barber Shop. And if you go into Mike's Barber Shop to get your hair cut, and you'd like to talk about politics, Mike will accommodate you. If you want to talk about fishing, Mike will accommodate you. If you want to talk about Jesus, Mike will certainly accommodate you. For years, Bert had had this friend named Randy Sweet. Randy was a race car driver, a very prominent businessman. Randy lived like he raced, hard and fast. He was not a man of God for many years. Bert had the unnatural ability to sell, and he could soft sell, he could hard sell, just about any variation. In his later years, Bert started soft selling faith, and he worked on Randy Smith for quite a long time soft-selling faith to Randy. Randy was also a customer at Mike's Barber Shop. And Randy would go in to get his hair cut, and, and Mike would do a little bit of faith selling as well. One day, Bert's in getting his hair cut at Mike's, and Randy walks in. Coincidence? I don't think so. Randy looks at Bert, and he looks at Mike. He says, you know what? He says, I want what you guys have. Right there in that little barber shop in Schoolcraft, Randy drops to his knees to claim his salvation. Bert had a hand on one shoulder. Mike had a hand on the other, and they prayed for him right there at the barber shop where Randy received Christ. <laughs> Bert and I shared a lot of friends. Another good friend is Dwayne White, who became a good friend of mine as well as Bert's. Bert and Dwayne go back many, many years. A lot of you here know Dwayne. If he walked in this room, Within 20 seconds, you would surely know him. Dwayne is loud. He is competitive. He's a great guy. He's a super friend, and he has a big heart. Dwayne, for many, many years, wasn't a faith man himself. But there again, Bert did a little bit of soft selling. Soft selling of faith. As Bert became ill and the illness got worse, Dwayne and I talked several times. And Dwayne said, you know, I'd really like to talk to him. I said, well, Dwayne, he's got good days and he's got bad days. I said, how about this? I said, I, I visit him fairly often. I said, the next time I visit him, how about if I put you on speakerphone and you talk to him that way? Because at this point, Bert couldn't use his hands to manipulate the phone himself. And Dwayne said, that'd be great. So I get over to see Bert, and it happened to be a pretty good day. We had to talk, and we conversed for a while. And I said, hey, Dwayne wants to talk to you. I said, you okay with that? And he says, yeah, I'd love to hear from Dwayne. So I dialed Dwayne up, and... I said, okay, Bert, here's Dwayne. And Dwayne says, hey, buddy, how you doing? And Bert says, I'm doing okay. Dwayne says, I'm praying for you. I 
Bert hesitates for a minute. He said, do you know what impresses me the most, Dwayne? Not the fact that you called me, the fact that you're praying. Bert's story led him to his purpose, and that was witnessing his faith in his own way. Look at the result of the two that I mentioned. Think about this for a minute. Randy passed away, and no doubt, because of his acceptance of Christ, he went to heaven. But remember, Randy was a hard-charging guy. He wasn't the type that, once he made that acceptance of Christ, he was quiet about it. Randy preached to his friends. Randy's deceased. He's went to heaven. But I know there's others that have went to heaven because of Randy. And look at Dwayne. Dwayne wasn't always a faith-filled man. He wouldn't talk about it to everybody. But now he's praying for others. What an example. So these are examples of faith that lead to the reward of eternal life in heaven. So typical of any funeral setting, we often sit and we reflect on our own life journey. So what's your story? Where's your faith? Are you ready to pray for someone? Or do you need to hit that barbershop floor? Faith, eternal life, what's it all really mean? Because of faith, Where do we end up? Oh, we end up in heaven. There's a lot of different ways to describe heaven. I want to take a minute and share something. This is a book called My Journey to Heaven. The author is Marv Besteman. Marv compares to Bert in my eyes because Marv was an avid golfer, astute businessman. He was a banker that uh, banked in Byron Center, Michigan. Marv went through an illness and he ended up at U of M where he died on the table. Marv went to heaven. When he got to heaven, he was greeted by the apostle Peter, who was his favorite apostle, because Marv was deeply rooted in his faith. At the gates of heaven, Peter had told him, Marv, I'm not sure that you're supposed to be here yet. And Marv is looking around, and he's able to see through the gates. And in this book, he describes what he's seen. And it's it's an incredible read. But he describes, as best he can, the colors, the way he felt, the other people he's seen. He goes on and on about all this description in the book. But then Peter comes back to him and says, Marv, I checked the book of life and you've got to go back. It's not your time. You have to go back to earth. Marv argued with Peter. Marv says, I don't want to go back. I want to stay here. That's what I really want you to think about. Marv wanted to stay in heaven. He wanted to witness those colors he was seeing. He wanted to spend time with those people he was seeing. But Marv had a family. 
He had daughters, grandchildren, a wife of many years. And he was willing to forego that. I married myself. Children, grandchildren. I can't imagine being anywhere and saying, I don't want to go back and see them. I want to stay here. I can't describe it. Marv does the best he can. It's just an absolutely incredible read. And what we did decide to do, once again, the, <clears throat> the book is called My Journey to Heaven. You can pick it up on Amazon, um, most of the bookstores. We have quite a few copies here. And if you're interested in this book, feel free. Please come down and grab one. Take it with you. And if you want to read a little bit more about my journey to heaven, there's Bibles next to them. Take one of those as well. We're going to have a couple people from the prayer team come up at this point. These folks will be here. If you have questions, you want to talk, you want somebody to pray for you, or you want to pray with someone, that's what these folks are here for. I ask you to please take the time, come down, spend a minute with them. Ask questions. If you're not comfortable coming to the front, as you go out the back doors, you'll see a bunch of guys with badges and patches like myself. They're chaplains from Kalamazoo County. They would love to pray for you as well. I'm going to pray here, and then at that time, please come down, see a prayer partner. Um, Steve is going to come up, and he will be giving us some further directions after I'm done with the prayer. Please join me. Father, we thank you so much for faith. We thank you for eternal life. We thank you for birth. We thank you for the sacrifice of Jesus. And we thank you for making it so easy for us to do the acceptance. I pray for Cheryl all of the family as we move on from today. And I pray for the friends that are here and online as well. And I pray your guidance upon them. And I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Steve? I would like to just take a moment and say thank you to a few people. First, I think we did a great job of honoring those that came up here with a, an applause, and I think we'd be remiss if we didn't do the same for Ken for staying here and giving his brother's life story. I also think we should uh, acknowledge uh, Ann did a beautiful job with the obituary, the one that you read inside the the program she wrote for her brother, and she did a wonderful job as well. And I'd like to thank those that came up here to share their stories, I think, and also sing a great song, uh, The Dance. I think uh, some of those life lessons that Bert gave, uh, we'll all remember those. So that, that those are pretty cool. So I also want to take a minute and thank uh, Pastor Jeff and the bridge uh, team here for welcoming us all into their building and, and, and allowing us to uh, share Bert's life. And I'd also like to thank the uh, Kalamazoo County chaplains that uh, Ken just mentioned a few minutes ago for being here uh, for one of their fellow brothers and then being here as a service to all of us. Uh, they help people uh, in their deepest uh, times of trial. and. Uh, our community is very thankful for them. But I also want to thank all of you uh, 
Today's Saturday. You guys all took time out of your day to be here with the family and show your love for them. And uh, I know that means a lot to Cheryl, to Kevin, Brian, and the entire Hoven Camp family. And I would like to thank them for allowing me to take care of Bert. It's meant a lot to my family and our funeral home team to, to be here to support you. So thank you for that. In just a few moments, we will be doing our dismissal. We're going to dismiss you into uh, the fellowship hall where you can have uh, some time to be together. Um, after that, privately, we are going to be taking Bert to uh, Oak Grove Cemetery in Lawton where he'll be interred. And then, as Ken mentioned, you have some prayer team uh, partners up here. Um, you know, I've been a funeral director for 30 years, and much like what Ken shared, I have found that's always a time to self-reflect. And I'm here to tell you that tomorrow's never a given. So take that time if you have it today. If today is not good for you, find somebody that you share a faith journey with that can meet you in the place that you're at. So I'm be, I want to close with that. And then during the time of the lunch, Bert's casket will be in the prayer room. Um, if you need to take a private minute uh, during your time in there, you're welcome to go into the prayer room and, and spend some time with Bert as well. And finally, uh, the pallbearers, um, at this time, I'm going to have you rise and come up to the casket. Ken's going to lead us out with the family following behind, and then our staff will help give you direction on after the family's uh, been dismissed. And again, thank you for your presence here today.
Tell him all about the man that I became And hope that it pleased him There's so much I want to say There's so much I want you to know When I fly 